In the Blitz on Bristol, one of the targets singled out by the Luftwaffe was the Bristol Aeroplane Company's works at Filton, where they built bombers for the RAF. The Blitz faded, Britain took the attack to the enemy, and BAC was asked to design a super bomber, able to fly 5,000 miles. That idea was dropped, to be replaced by an even bigger project for Bristol, one that would make every other aircraft then flying look small. Back in 1943, the Brabazon, largest land plane the world has ever seen, was an idea banded across committee table, drawing board and desk. How many passengers? Was a hundred enough? Too many? London to New York, counting the headwinds, is 5,000 miles. So how much would the petrol weigh? And what about the cost? While critics of the venture hinted that this was no time for national extravagance, an army of draftsmen were detailing how the job could be done. I think the announcement that we were going to build this airliner was about March 1943. And if you consider this was a pretty tough time of the war, we were just about beginning to pull through, just beginning to see light at the end of the tunnel. And it really was quite remarkable that we had this kind of foresight, because here we were looking ahead to the time of, we never doubted we would win, but here we were looking ahead what well, obviously was many years ahead. What kind of airliner should we build? And we had a committee chaired by Lord Brabazon, and they were composed of members of the aircraft industry, all kinds of experts, and they decided on five new types of airliner. And the very first one, called the Brabazon One, that's where the name came from, was to be a non-stop London to New York aeroplane, carrying passengers and mail. This had never been done before. It was only just about possible, and it meant a gigantic aeroplane. Unfortunately, the image that the name Brabazon conjures up today is of an enormous white elephant which should never have been built. Sir Archibald Russell designed the Brabazon. He began at Bristol's helping to design biplanes in the 20s, and he ended as chief British designer of Concorde. He knows about aeroplanes. It used to be argued sometimes in debating societies that aircraft design is more an art than a science. There is an article of faith that what looks right is right. But of course, when you increase the size by four times, you don't know what's required. What, what looks right. So uh, we recruited some very able men straight from university, well versed in mathematics and the theories of the different branches of engineering. And we set them up in a pre-design office to be consulted and looked for advice on the right solution with a different problem, with a problem we were not used to. Russell and his team knew that they were creating a cunarder of the air. Passengers on the Brabazon were to travel in style. They would have their own bunks in private cabins, powder rooms, a cocktail bar, even a separate cinema. Brabazon would offer space and luxury, just like the great transatlantic liners. Which was another reason for the size of the plane, so unbelievably huge that the public's understanding of it had to be helped along by comparing Brabazon with the Statue of Liberty or Nelson's Column. Before BAC began creating a Brabazon that would fly, they made a mock-up out of wood and paper. It was built to the same scale as the real thing, and craftsmen at Filton, who were accustomed to crawling through the cramped fuselages of ordinary planes, were startled at the first sight of these massive dimensions. The Brabazon seemed cavernous, colossal. To be chosen for the project was considered a privilege. One man who worked on it as an apprentice is Councillor Bob Wall, now Sir Robert Wall. It's a great leap forward. Now, there was only one company, really, who could do that, and that was this Bristol company with its, its structural techniques. Um, and it was built more like a ship, really, than an aeroplane. Uh, the first machine was built over in number two flight shed, not here in the hangar. Uh, very tight fit. Uh, in fact, it was a tremendous operation actually getting it out of that, that hangar. Uh, and it was built, really, with, with a, a series of jigs, a bit like a, on the stocks of a shipyard, built from the bottom cradle up and then the, the big frames put in. Of course, all this was worked out on a wooden mock-up. 
what often isn't appreciated is that it not only was a fine looking aeroplane and it sounds strange to talk about this white elephant as being a great achievement but it was it was such a difficult design to fly non-stop across the north atlantic westbound that every ounce had to be saved that could possibly be saved draftsman studying the shell of a bird's egg had discovered that strength may lie in shape not in girder for the first time ever not only in britain but in any country even the skin panels that cover the wings and the fuselage they were measured all over they weren't standard stock they were specially arranged so that the thicknesses were just right for the job the engines were of course the engines that were needed for the job the first Brabazon had piston engines because that was the only way that you could fly the Atlantic gas turbines either jets or propeller turbines burnt far too much fuel in those early days they were inefficient from the fuel point of view so you had to have piston engines and you certain you just simply needed a certain amount of power and the power that you needed was 20,000 horsepower that's eight engines of 2,500 horsepower each and the only way that you could do it was to have four pairs of coupled engines these themselves were a, a very major engineering achievement so you had two huge engines and a giant gearbox out of which came a long propeller shaft, two propeller shafts, one inside the other, turning these enormous propellers. Near the Brabazon, they were building an assembly hall so huge that it could have taken both the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth side by side. When it became time to shift Brabazon out of the old flight shed and into the new hangar, she was already so big there were just inches to spare. So they called it Operation Shoehorn. At Bristol, we get a first glimpse of the Brabazon transport plane. The 126-ton airliner is transferred for completion to a newly built hangar. More than four million pounds worth of material has gone into giving Britain the world's biggest airplane. The 143-foot-long passenger compartment can seat 100 people who will fly the Atlantic in 12 hours. Bill Pegg, Bristol's chief test pilot, was going to have to fly a machine that was radically different from any other. So, to help him familiarize himself, all its internal workings were laid out on the hangar floor, and were operated to simulate flight. The hydraulic systems in particular were assembled and tested to give Peg a feel of how this massive complex plane would perform. It wasn't like this. First of all, the flight deck was much bigger. In fact, you could have held a dance on it compared to this. And while there were as many instruments, most of them were back on the flight engineer's panel. And in those days, we had two flight engineers, one for the engine equipment and one for the aircraft equipment. There were a lot of new things on it. And of course, the first thing was the size. It was enormous compared to other things we'd flown. I'd flown Lancasters and Lincolns, which are about 30 tons. And here we are going to an aeroplane 150 or 170 tons. Uh, it was the first uh, modern airliner the British aviation had made. It was a tricycle undercarriage, pressurized. We had AC-generated electrics instead of DC in batteries. We had humidification in the air conditioning system. High-pressure hydraulics for operating undercarriage retraction. All through the aircraft, electricians have been busy installing the 1,300 fused circuits required for normal service and flight research. Six alternators together producing 180 kilovolt amps and 150 miles of cable through which will flow sufficient power to supply the needs of a small town. <laughs> 
that you see there are two ways of looking at all these things. Either you can say, what an engineering achievement, or you can say, what a waste of effort. Depends which way you look at it. 130 tons of aeroplane was going to need a strong runway, and a long one. BAC already had nearly a mile of it. Now they wanted to extend this to a mile and three quarters. Aircraft are designed to meet the airworthiness requirements that they should be able to take off in a certain distance, but that if they have a, an engine failure at the point of liftoff, they can switch the other engines off, break and stop within, within a given distance. So, so a runway length is fixed by the distance required for an aborted takeoff. We always tend to go rather overboard on things in this country. We wanted to build an enormously strong and very long runway for the Brabazon. And again, with the benefit of hindsight, we didn't need to do this because the Brabazon took off in a very short distance and it landed in a very short distance. Extending the runway was good news for Brabazon, but bad news for the little village of Charlton. It was slap bang in the way. I think the first time we suspected that uh, we were going to have a problem was when we realized this enormous hangar was being built on the airfield. And then people working up there, of course, began to talk about the Brabazon and the fact that the runway would have to be extended. Now, the only way it could be extended was towards Charlton Village. Representations were made to stop it. And, but then as the work progressed and the aircraft was built, uh, it became absolutely inevitable that um, Charlton Village would, in fact, be destroyed. Once the bulldozers moved in, the houses came down fast. The runway builders got to work, and within a couple of weeks, you wouldn't have known Charlton had ever existed. Into the runway foundations, they rolled rubble from the war blitz buildings of nearby Bristol. Well, they just come along and we had letters from the air ministry to say, oh, you've got to move out, there's a place for you being built at Patchway. And that was that, we just couldn't do nothing else. We just had to, and I was the first one of the first to move up here rather than be next door neighbor. I was the first one to go. They said, you're right in the middle of the runway. We had to go. Well, I tell you, it was terrible. You, you felt badly? Bad, I never had no sleep for nights. Nice cried several nights, I just couldn't go to sleep. There's some old ladies here that they did they well they died with broken hearts really. We were told that by the children that was left. They said mother and father they died of broken hearts. You you've got to set it in the context of the times. Charlton wasn't the only village to be demolished for an airfield. There were hundreds of villages demolished through the United Kingdom in 1939 and 40. And at the time the decision was taken to demolish Charlton well, I mean, hundreds of German towns and cities were going down every night. Um, today, of course, you'd have a tremendous outcry from the environmentalists. Well, we only knocked down a couple of houses, a duck bend and a pub, and the pub upset everybody to put the runway on the hangar in and build this prototype. And I think that total was only about 11 or 12 million pounds, which isn't much these days. But this put Bristol really on the map, and it has to this day. Because remember, around here, this is the biggest conglomeration of aerospace technology, and it employs 25,000 people. And that means that it feeds 125,000 miles of Bristol, which is a good amount. And this has come out, the real backbone of the place is having that runway and the hangar. Certainly it was a heavy aeroplane, it needed a strong runway. But there's not the slightest doubt in my mind, we didn't need to extend that runway at Filton at all, and Charlton could still be there today. For good or ill, Charlton was now past history, and Brabazon was about to make new history. Here she comes, 130 tons of superlative engineering, six years of research, 
ingenuity, invention. The chief test pilot, his co-pilot and a crew of eight men go aboard. time, the Brabazon moves forward under her own engines. Now she starts on the first of many long runs up and down the runway to get the feel of her, to find out how she will behave. The time approaches when no more can be done on the ground. Hello, control. Hello, control. I'm going to make a fairly fast run now. It may be a takeoff. It may not. I don't know. Now she's moving. Bill Pegg's piled on all the power onto those eight engines. Faster and faster now, beginning to pick up speed. She's passing alongside me now, quite a noise she's making. And she's going faster and faster, faster and faster. And the nose wheel is off, the nose wheel is off. And I'm looking to see if the main wheels come off as well. The main wheel, she's off, she's off. She's hopped along the ground. The Brabazon is in the air. And she's in the air, she's climbing away. Oh, that was a straight takeoff. He ran oh, uh, less than half the length of the runway. He's got a bit of flap on. And now this enormous aeroplane is in the air. And as it passes over Pat Beach at the end of the runway, I hand you to Pat Beach. You must have a superb view of it. Over to Pat Beach. Absolutely superb. Yes, she's coming only about 300 yards away and just passing me here. And she looks as steady as a rock as though she's been flying for thousands and thousands of hours. Majestic, great silver cigar going past away to my right out towards Camp Brook. I was co-pilot on the first test flight of the Brabazon nearly 40 years ago and second captain after about 20 hours. And on the day, I remember it well, we went down the runway and Bill Pegg was the captain and we'd made up our mind actually to take off that flight. Some people say we got into the air by mistake, but that's wrong. We definitely made up our mind to take off. And the aeroplane came off the ground a little bit earlier than we anticipated and started to climb. And we got a two or three hundred feet, and I noticed the control column was hard forward and the trimmer wound forward. And poor old Bill was really sweating. And I looked up in the roof and saw that the elevator was fully down, and the nose was still going up. And that was wrong. So I grabbed hold of the throttles and pulled them back, and the nose went down, and I pushed the power on again. And that cured the item. And that was the only worry we had on the first flight. And uh, they did an adjustment on the elevator for the next flight, and all was well. The Brabazon 1 first flew in September 1949, and it's a remarkable fact that a little way off at Hatfield, the de Havilland Company built an aeroplane called the Comet 1, and they had that in the air in July 1949. That's ahead of the Brabazon. It was started later and carried through quicker, and that was a jet. It was the world's first jet airliner. And you only had to compare the two to see that passengers were going to prefer the jet, even if it had a shorter range and perhaps had to stop halfway. Uh, Russ and his team actually met the specification um, dead on. I mean, the aeroplane did exactly what was required of it. Um, it developed all the new features. 
and it worked precisely to what the customer asked. And that's the business in, in aviation. You must get the customer's requirements right, come what may. If the customer has ordered the wrong aeroplane, then basically that's not your fault. But the customer in this case did order the wrong aeroplane. Unfortunately, if you look ahead a little bit, there were lots of technical problems. It couldn't have got into service much before 1954-55, even with piston engines. There was a later Brabazon II, which had turboprops, and these gave a tremendous amount of, pro of problems. And 1956, the Americans were beginning to build an aeroplane called the Boeing 707, which was a jet doing 600 miles an hour. And by the end of the 50s, the 707 was also a non-stop transatlantic aeroplane. Now, you only have to compare the two to see that one is a starter and the other one isn't. Brabazon went to Heathrow. Government ministers, heads of airlines, VIPs from all over were given every chance to see for themselves just what the plane had to offer. Many aviation journalists flew in Brabazon and experienced its remarkable smoothness and roominess. One such journalist was Bill Gunston. It was never properly furnished, of course. It was full of instruments and it had just something like 30 standard BOAC passenger seats shoved in the back. The characteristic noise of the takeoff was recorded from the inside by one of our sound cameras, which was also on board. It was enormous. It was something we weren't used to. It was strictly comparable with a modern jumbo jet for size. This will give you an idea of the sort of interior. And if you can imagine a jumbo jet with no furnishing, just a sort of bare metal hull with, with seats, that's what it was like. But Although it was a beautiful, graceful, smooth aeroplane, we knew by this time it was being obsoleted by advancing technology. And I remember when I got on board that aeroplane, I felt quite convinced we would never see a second one take the air. In fact, Brabazon Mark II was never even finished. Four years after the maiden flight, both planes were sold for scrap. Within a couple of weeks, they were chopped up and gone. From that time onwards, all that the public generally could see was a so-called waste of money. And ever since then, the word Brabazon has conjured up bad news, a simple white elephant, something which should never have been started. It was really not the right solution for the Atlantic. It was too slow. But at the time, of course, we were quite unaware that gas turbines were just around the corner. They were so secret during the war that no one heard about them. Not even the ministry. Uh, they didn't suggest that, 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 that we should think of that sort of engine. That, the, the answer would have been quite different. The trouble with aviation, especially big-time main, mainstream airliners, is that it takes a long time to go from the drawing board to the hardware that's flying and selling tickets, like 10 years. And in 10 years, especially in those days, the technology is totally transformed. And whereas in 1943, it seemed the most natural thing in the world to build the Brabazon one, by 1953, we were steamrolling rolling in, into the ground. It was only by the mid-50s we could begin to see that you could do the same job with a smaller and faster aeroplane. Indeed, BAC were soon to build just such an airliner, the Bristol Britannia. Followed, of course, by the Concorde. Had we known you we were only going to have 16 production Concords, I don't think it would have been started. Building aeroplanes is no different from building cars or producing toothpaste. It's a product that you have to sell for a profit. Building aeroplanes is a commercial business, and it's not a bad idea if you have a customer. The trouble is, the customer for the Brabazon was a ministry, and ministries don't operate aeroplanes. <laughs> 
what you want to have is either an air force or an airline, or of course with small aeroplanes, a private owner. And then you can talk to the customer and say, what do you want? What are you trying to do? What kind of aeroplane do you need? If you talk to a ministry, ministries aren't too concerned about the price of a ticket. They're far more concerned with, uh, shall we say, their own careers, their own career structure, the union jack. There are all sorts of angles come into it. And the Brabazon was one of a whole string of aeroplanes built for a ministry customer, which perhaps, and I only say perhaps, ought never have been started in the first place. But for the Brabazon, there would be no Brabazon hangar. A thousand feet long, 117 feet high, and at its greatest, 420 feet deep. To say that this enormous building has turned out to be a legacy of great value is an understatement. It's now 40 years old, and it looks as good as new. Here, BAC, now British Aerospace, build the center fuselage units for the BAE 146 regional jetliner. This Brabazon um, assembly hall here, and that runway that was constructed, have been used in every major aviation project in Bristol since that time. Now, um, when the Brabazon came along, Filton was a factory on the side of a hill producing small twin-engine fighters. Um, after the Brabazon, it had the major aircraft manufacturing facility in Europe. Um, it turned Bristol, really, into the aviation capital of Europe. Um, I don't know how many people depend on aviation in this Bristol area today, but it must be 50 to 60,000 people directly or indirectly getting their, uh, their living from the aviation industry. And then the spin-off into the rest of the community is, 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 is absolutely terrific. In those days, we tended to get things wrong. Today, with a company like Airbus, we tend to get things right. And you have to. We simply can't afford to have mistakes like the Brabazon anymore. And while it would be entirely wrong to suggest the Brabazon was a sick joke from the start, it would also be entirely wrong to look upon it as a great national thing that was uh, something of which we should all be proud. It was a commercial non-starter, and I would suggest a commercial non-starter, not a technical non-starter. with a different problem, with a problem we were not used to. Russell and his team knew that they were creating a cunarder of the air. Passengers on the Brabazon were to travel in style. They would have their own bunks in private cabins, powder rooms, a cocktail bar, even a separate cinema. Brabazon would offer space and luxury, just like the great transatlantic liners. Which was another reason for the size of the plane, so unbelievably huge that the public's understanding of it had to be helped along by comparing Brabazon with the Statue of Liberty or Nelson's Column. Before BAC began creating a Brabazon that would fly, they made a mock-up out of wood and paper. It was built to the same scale as the real thing, and craftsmen at Filton, who were accustomed to crawling through the cramped fuselages of ordinary planes, 
were startled at the first sight of these massive dimensions. The Brabazon seemed cavernous, colossal. To be chosen for the project was considered a privilege. One man who worked extravagance, an army of draftsmen were detailing how the job could be done. I think the announcement that we were going to build this airliner was about March 1943. And if you consider this was a pretty tough time of the war, we were just about beginning to pull through, just beginning to see light at the end of the tunnel. And it really was quite remarkable that we had this kind of foresight, because here we were looking ahead to the time of, we never doubted we would win, but here we were looking ahead what obviously was many years ahead. What kind of airliner should we build? And we had a committee chaired by Lord Brabazon, and they were composed of members of the aircraft industry, all kinds of experts, and they decided on five new types of airliner. And the very first one, called the Brabazon One, that's where the name came from, was to be a non-stop London to New York aeroplane, carrying passengers and mail. This had never been done before. Worked on it as an apprentice is Councillor Bob Wall, now Sir Robert Wall. It's a great leap forward. Now, there was only one company, really, who could do that, and that was this Bristol company with its, its structural techniques. Um, and it was built more like a ship, really, than an aeroplane. Uh, the first machine was built over in number two flight shed, not here in the hangar. Uh, very tight fit. Uh, in fact, it was a tremendous operation actually getting it out of that, that hangar. Uh, and it was built, really, with, with a, a series of jigs, a bit like a, on the stocks of a shipyard, built from the bottom cradle up and then the, the big frames put in, because all this was worked out on a wooden mock-up. What often isn't appreciated is that it not only was a fine-looking aeroplane, and it sounds strange to talk about this white elephant as being a great achievement, but it was. It was such a difficult design to fly non-stop across the North Atlantic westbound that every ounce had to be saved that could possibly be saved. Draftsman studying the shell of a bird's egg. In the Blitz on Bristol, one of the targets singled out by the Luftwaffe was the Bristol Aeroplane Company's works at Filton, where they built bombers for the RAF. The Blitz faded, Britain took the attack to the enemy, and BAC was asked to design a super bomber able to fly 5,000 miles. That idea was dropped to be replaced by an even bigger project for Bristol, one that would make every other aircraft then flying look small. Back in 1943, the Brabazon, largest land plane the world has ever seen, was an idea banded across committee table, drawing board and desk. How many passengers? Was a hundred enough? Too many? London to New York, counting the headwinds, is 5,000 miles. So how much would the petrol weigh? And what about the cost? While critics of the venture hinted that this was no time for national... Or it was only just about possible, and it meant a gigantic aeroplane. Unfortunately, the image that the name Brabazon conjures up today is of an enormous white elephant which should never have been built. Sir Archibald Russell designed the Brabazon. He began at Bristol's helping to design biplanes in the 20s, and he ended as chief British designer of Concorde. He knows about aeroplanes. It used to be argued sometimes in debating societies that aircraft design is more an art than a science. There is an article of faith that what looks right is right. But of course, when you increase the size by four times, you don't know what's look right. What, what looks right. So uh, we recruited some very able men straight from university, well versed in mathematics and the theories of the different branches of engineering. And we set them up in a pre-design office to be consulted and looked for advice on the right 